I used to pray the Lord's Prayer. Most of you know I was a hospice chaplain and my patients in the Fox Valley were mostly Lutherans or Catholics, the smattering of Methodists or Presbyterians mixed in. When we lifted up concerns in prayer, many of them found comfort and peace in saying the Lord's Prayer with me. I have to confess, for me, it felt false and uncomfortable at first. Certain words grated on my consciousness. Its formal words and requests seemed so far away from anything that felt like a connection for me. And yet, when I peeked out from underneath my bowed head, I could see that many of my patients were glowing with a sense of comfort and peace in reciting those old and familiar ancient words. Do you pray? Or don't you? I think a lot of us in this room have an interesting relationship with prayer. If you were like me, maybe you were raised in a typical Christian home. My family was ELCA, ELCA Lutheran. We didn't exactly practice our faith much outside of Sunday mornings, but it had a place in our lives in times of trouble or in times of joy. Over time, my prayers became a conversation with God, sharing my troubles mostly. They would usually end with requests for things that I wanted. Looking back, I'm surprised I didn't just imagine God in a red Santa Claus suit, because that's really how it was playing out with me and God. Dear God, I need this. Please make it happen for me. That would be so great, and then my life would finally be perfect. Thank you. Amen. As I grew older, I began to see those kinds of prayers were just that, a wish list for what I wanted. I stopped praying those kind of prayers. In fact, in college, I stopped praying. I had trouble making sense of the God that I was raised with. As my life continued and I began to study other faith traditions and discovered Unitarian Universalism, my view of prayer and meditation began to shift. I began to see prayer as a way of becoming part of something bigger than myself. I began to pray again, but in a different way. Like the storybook you just heard. I began to recognize prayer and song and dance and nature and good food and powerful films, you name it. I've now come to a place where I see so many things as a prayer. What a change from when I could only see prayer as a request for so many things. And so somehow that long winding journey brought me back to those moments that I spent sitting across from my patients, holding their hands and earnestly praying the Lord's Prayer. Writer and Christian Anne Lamont says there's three basic types of prayer, help, thanks, and wow. Just for today, I'm asking you not to get bogged down in to whom we pray. Today, I'm gonna to invite you to think about changing prayer. Many of us carry a lot of baggage from our past that has us questioning its direction, who's it going to, what's its purpose, as Unitarian Universalists, it's easy for us to get stuck there. In fact, that's often the first question people ask me when I explain what our faith welcomes. And I'm sure you've heard this too. Well, who do you pray to? They ask with disbelief. Unitarian Universalists could argue about this for decades, and I'm sure we could do a great job today continuing that argument. But for us, in this moment, what if we borrowed from Anne Lamont and we define prayer as a communication from our hearts to the great mysterious or to the animating energy of love that we are sometimes bold enough to believe in. These are words I can get behind. These are words that for me describe what I might be praying for and praying to. For me, when I'm confused or anxious or upset, prayer or medica meditation is my real self trying to reach out and to be heard 
in that moment, I'm hoping to escape my feelings of fear or shame that I'm caught up in. I'm seeking instead to find light and warmth and love in this world. And I wonder, what if we reframed all the things we do each day that give us a sense of meaning or a sense of connection? What if we saw those things as forms of prayer? For myself, I found that perhaps all things in which, in which we express ourselves honestly can serve as little prayers as we reach out and share our universal experiences with one another. And Lamott feels that the most common prayer that escapes from our lips in times of trouble is help. The help prayer happens when we're so devastated by circumstances that we feel we have no, nothing that we can move towards, that we're lost. We admit that we can't do it by ourselves. When disaster hits, cancer, illnesses, or accidents, my childhood prayers might have begged or demand fix that problem. But now life has taught me that sometimes the journey is not about the end results. Now I might pray or meditate for courage and strength to walk through those things. As granddad said in our story, we don't pray to change the world. We pray to change ourselves. You and I lifted up a help prayer this morning, sharing our concerns in this service. In all reality, that's a help prayer. We're letting our circle of loving know what's difficult for us right now. How often have you been down or afraid and you've shared that with a loved one? We do it all the time with family and friends and coworkers, and sometimes they have a solution and our problem is solved, and sometimes they don't, and the problem is still there. And yet just by sharing our problem, we somehow feel a little bit better. Our load seems a little bit lighter. The simple act of sharing with a friend is like a prayer. For me, that's what praying does. It lets the universe and others know that I'm overwhelmed. I'm at the end of my rope. And in that moment of surrendering my fears and worries to someone or something outside myself, I've also gotten pretty real with myself. I've admitted that I'm lost and I'm feeling vulnerable. And Lamont feels there's a freedom in that vulnerability. It's admitting that you won't be able to save or rescue your child or spouse or parents or your career. You're actually admitting that you have reached this place of great unknowing. The great unknowing. This is the place where Buddhist Pema Chodron says we are fully alive and completely awake. She says to live fully is to always be in that space. To live, says children, is to be willing to die over and over and over again. And to me, that sounds exhausting and horrible. And then again, I know it's true. Life is always changing us. And when I'm at my most vulnerable, I use prayer to reach out something bigger than myself and breathe out that pain and suffering it allows me to wail and vent and release emotional pressure it puts words to my anguish and to be honest i believe there's real power in that when we put voice to the reality of a situation it changes us it forces us to pause, and yes, Pema Children was right. We are fully alive in that moment. Ty Alford has been my yoga teacher. He also meditates, writes poetry and music. I think of all of these are ways he prays each day. In class one day, he shared that the front of our bodies represent our own self-effort. It's all we do to get through our days. The back of our bodies represent the support and grace and care of the universe 
And whoever got us to where we are now, family, friends, mentors, or teachers. And as he was explaining this, I thought about the help prayer. In times of crisis, our bodies shout out to say, I've been going forward into this world trying to solve this problem, but it hasn't worked. But what if we remembered that we are connected to this world more than just the front of ourselves? We're connected to all that has brought us to this place, these people, this earth, this grace, and this love. Prayer reminds us that we are connected. Prayer helps us to feel less alone and less afraid. And guess what? As you've heard me share before, my favorite thing in the world is to find out that holy things are actually tangible. There's science behind this idea of prayer. Currently more than 200 controlled experiments in humans, plants, animals, and even microbes suggest that compassionate, loving prayers and intentions of one individual can actually affect another. These studies paint a picture of human consciousness that's infinite. Our individual mind appear, appears to be connected to all other minds, no matter how far apart. And as you use, we know this. We have a seventh principle that we believe in the interconnected web of life. We are connected to one another and to everything. Tiknahan says that whenever we join our palms together in a daily practice of meditation or prayer, clarity and understanding are produced. When there's more understanding, there's more love. And our state of health improves, not only as individuals, but also as a community. And I think we saw some of that in this past election. With all of that collective love and care and grace lifting us up, the first word that comes to my mind is thanks. And Lamont says that the thanks prayer runs the gamut from sharing your heart and saying thanks, I appreciate my good health, or that was a good day at the office, to saying thanks, what a relief. It's not the car's transmission or a tumor or an audit notice from the IRS or even more desperately, thank you, thank you, thank you. My wife is going to live. We get to stay in our house. They found my son and he's alive and safe. I secretly love the little short prayers that Thich Nhat Hanh uses for daily activities. One of my favorites is called waking up. Waking up this moment, this morning, I smile. 24 brand new hours are before me. I vow to live fully in each moment and to look at all beings with eyes of compassion. Oh my goodness, what a marvelous way to start the day. Many of my patients felt abandoned by the God they'd been taught about. Alone in assisted living or a nursing home, perhaps their family was too busy to visit as often as they would like. Their faith told them that God was with them, but they often had a lot of trouble seeing it or feeling it. Yet if I could help them to step back and view things a little bit differently, I could help them to see the divinity in all the staff that came in and out of their rooms each and every day. Those who helped them to wash or dress had holy hands. Housekeepers who swept and dust, cooks who shopped and chopped and baked, social workers who handled insurance and community assistance, nurses who offered medication and care, Chaplains like myself who held their hands and listened to them and prayed with them. These were all holy hands. 
I like to imagine that everyone who walked through their door collectively formed something bigger than themselves, that collectively we were showing love to one another in all the little things we did for each other every day. Waking up this morning, I smile. 14 brand, 24 brand new hours before me. Maybe I only have 14. <laughs> We've all heard the catchphrase that we should practice gratitude. And I agree, it is a practice. It seems we must train ourselves to do it because our minds go more to the negative all the time. We let small things weigh too heavily. We grip tightly to old hurts. And it's then that we need to practice to lift up our heads and see how blue the sky is and listen instead to the sound of a bird singing outside. Perhaps we decide to recognize with great intention that we are blessed to have food in our refrigerators, clothing on our backs and a roof over our heads. Each of you have this beautiful fellowship to come to and learn and celebrate together, especially when you're hurting or feeling lost. Rumi says, there are many ways to kiss the ground. We can find much to be grateful for if we only open our eyes and see it. Gratitude begins in our hearts and then it dovetails into behavior. And Lamont says that being grateful almost always makes you willing to be of service to others. And that is where joy resides. When you're aware of all that you've been given, it's hard not to want to share it. When we go from scratchy and clenched to grateful, we're often given the experience of grace. And when that happens, something shifts within us, something changes within us. We find that something had to open up, something had to give away. Being present and noticing our blessings invites us to say thanks. And that movement of grace towards gratitude brings us from that discomfort of our self-obsessed madness to a spiritual awakening. And that is wow the wow prayer is offered with a gasp a sharp intake of breath wow is having one's mind blown by the mesmerizing and the miraculous wow signals a loss of words for me wow usually comes when i'm blown away by love or nature's beauty in my work, I saw people who loved tremendously, families who sacrificed for one another, never complaining, and in fact, doing so with great joy. Coming from a family that doled out love in small measured amounts, this surprised me every single time. And it made me see how deep and powerful the human spirit can be. I saw a young 18 year old nursing assistant come in on her day off to hold the hand of a dying patient. Wow. I saw people finally letting go and forgiving one another for long held grievances, their faces shining with joy and tears and relief. Wow. Thich Nhat Hanh shares a wow prayer. Breathing in, I'm so happy to hug my child. Breathing out, I know she's real and alive in my arms. I recalled after giving birth, I felt like a wow prayer. How did my body know how to do that? How did the nurses and doctors know what to do? How did my baby know what to do? Wow. Nature is a place where wow prayers occur. I've been fortunate to preach at the UU Congregation in St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands a few times. While we were there, my husband Joel and I made a habit of watching the sunset from a new spot every evening. All were beautiful, but some were spectacular. 
deep reds and purples and oranges and pinks. The sky looked like it was on fire. And like our reading by Mary Oliver, I find wow in the delicate formation and color of the iris. I found wow in the beautiful colors of the trees this fall. I know all of us can think of music that has moved us tremendously into tears. I think that is a wow prayer. Hearing a poet share their truth with words that are so sharp and true. Watching an actor portray an emotion or feeling that seems so universal, that is a wow prayer. Thich Nhat Hanh wonders why we pray. Why do we put these things into words or into action? Perhaps, he says, because all the energy of prayer comes back to our simple human desire for happiness, to be connected to others, and to be part of something greater than ourselves. Prayer, whether chanted, silent, in meditation, or dance, or sung, or painted, is a way to return to ourselves, to the present moment, and touch the truth and peace that's always residing in here. So I ask you, how do you seek help when you're vulnerable or hurting? How do you give thanks for all that surrounds you? How do you express yourself when there are no words? Do you fall to your knees in traditional prayer do you sit quietly in nature, soaking in the sounds and the sights? Do you write in your journal or create a poem or write a song? Do you paint or dance or sing at the top of your lungs? Do you hold a loved one close? And are these prayers? I believe with every fiber of my being that they are. Call it what you will, but it is deeply, deeply holy. When we do these things, we are suddenly connected to something bigger than ourselves. We've all been there. We've all felt it when those kind of activities pull us out of our own darkness and into holy light. And that feeling is always, always, wow. May it be so. Um, two personal comments that, that struck me as I was listening to you, Karen. Um, one, one for me is I've often, um, if I've gotten together with friends and we've had, you know, we've shared and I've said this was therapeutic. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to change, if I remember, change that word to prayer. Because it felt so, it feels so good sometimes. And I'll just say, this was therapeutic. It meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to change that to prayer. And then um, the other thing, reading our, that book, The Grandfather, um, everybody knows I have a bunch of grandchildren. And we do take those walks. And, um, and my grandchildren collect those sticks and those stones. The one thing I'm going to change is I've often said, you know, they'll pick up the stones and they might ask me to help carry them. And usually if we start out on our walk, I'll say, you know, what you pick up, you carry. Don't hand it to me. I'm going to help them carry now when they ask me to. I love that. That is beautiful. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to tell you that was my husband narrating the book. Yeah, 
He was so sweet because I looked for videos of that story and it was always like a librarian, you know, holding a book and da 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 da. And it was good, but I just said, I just want to see the pages. And he's a tech guy. So he's like, oh, I'll do it. And I'll narrate it because it's a boy's voice. And he said when he got to the end, his father died. Um, his dad was 59 when he died. So he was on the younger side. And so I had a hard time on that last page, the last couple pages. So, any other comments? Jackie, um, so I even uh, I have a Mary Oliver uh, phrase tattooed on my hand. Oh, I guess that it's uh, "Be still, my soul, and steadfast." And one of my favorite poems of hers is uh, "Wild Geese." Mm -hmm. She talks about um, wanting to uh, be be called into the great family of things, to be uh, a part of something. Mm -hmm. And I came here to Wisconsin from. I was in South America for like a month or so, just for the election. Um, and Kathy and all the folks in Manitowoc have been really welcoming. Um, so yeah, I just want to say, I guess like it's a wow thing for me because, you know, I've been to like 71 countries and I'm about to go on the Camino de Santiago, the, the walk to the 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 famous church at the end of the coast of Spain mm -hmm. um, from Porto. Um, and uh, this is one of those wow moments where I think uh, a lot of things are just a part of the family of things and something that I will definitely remember. So I just wanted to say thank you for for Mary Oliver shout outs because mm -hmm. I always have her tattoo on my hand. And, uh, yeah. I would say Mary Oliver is sort of the patron poet of the Unitarian Universalist. <laughs> Oh yeah, well I'm Catholic, so I don't know. That's, yeah. Sorry, that's okay. Santa. Yeah, but um, you might, I mean, you guys may have converted me. Who knows? But uh, yeah, we love her. That's for sure. And your walk is going to be a prayer. I've had some friends who've done that walk, and it is a prayer. Anything else? Has a comment to make. Otherwise, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Absolutely wonderful.